What's up, Daw Nation? Here's a question for you. Does your mental health affect your music? If you are mentally healthy, are you able to create music more consistently? Are you able to create it more passionately? Are you able to be more creative? And consequently, if your mental health isn't in check, does your music suffer because of it? Are you not able to create the type of music that actually resonates with you? These are all really good questions and they are gonna be answered in this week's episode of Behind the Daw with Prince Fox. So let's go ahead and cue the intro video. Unless you're on the podcast, then you're going to enjoy this delightfully dope drop. Right, Ben? I'm, he's not here, but I'm sure he would say yes. What's up, Don Nation? My name is Wyatt Troy. I'm a music producer, much like yourself, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Behind the Dog. Now, if you're new to the series, totally cool. Go ahead and just high five yourself because you are taking a very big step on your music production journey. This is a series where we interview huge music producers, music industry experts, singers, songwriters, sound designers, everyone else in between on an emotional, philosophical, branding, marketing, and overall music business basis. So if you want to keep learning from huge people in the music industry so that you can number one, get better at music, number two, make a bigger impact with your music, and number three, start making a living off something that you're actually passionate about, then go ahead right below this video is a little subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button and take that little notification bell so that every single time we put out a new piece of content, you get notified and you can keep growing as a music producer, as a musician, so on and so forth. Also, if you're on podcast, obviously there's no video. So wherever you are on podcast, go ahead and subscribe, follow, repost, whatever is appropriate on the particular platform that you're listening on. So Don Nation, with all that out of the way, how is this video going to benefit you on your music journey? It's a great question, it's a fantastic question. So like I mentioned in the intro of this video, we are interviewing Prince Fox. He's amazing, he's incredible, he's absolutely huge. We talk about a lot of things in this episode, but four things that you can absolutely plan to walk away with are, number one, what are the complex needs of a human being? Now, we all know our basic needs. Food, water, sleep, Ableton, it's fine. But what are the complex needs of humans? Needs that are just kind of glossed over because they're too complex, they're like, oh no, not everyone needs those. Just a few people, just some people, and only sometimes, right? What are those complex needs? The second thing that we're gonna be talking about is why you do not need to be afraid to be authentic. So we actually kind of talked about this concept back in the Behind the Dot episode that we did with Lexi Norton from Echo, so you should go check that out as well. But you don't need to be afraid to be authentic. In fact, it's really healthy for you to be authentic, to let your true feelings, your true thoughts out. In fact, as you do that, it actually attracts the right kind of people. You know, the kind of people that, you know, that are that are hurt by that, they're offended by that. You don't want them around anyways. And the type of people that will hear your feelings and see your authentic self and, and be attracted to that, that's the kind of people you want around, right? So we're gonna be talking about that in great detail. But the third thing that we're gonna be talking about this week is why it is totally, utterly, completely, brutally stupid to compare yourself to others. Now, you can compare your works to others. Okay, you can compare, okay, my song isn't as loud as this other person's. What do I need to do to fix that? Okay, this person is getting this result. I'm not getting this result. How do I fix that? But what you shouldn't do, what you shouldn't do is compare your worth to that person, your sense of identity to, to that person, your sense of importance to that person. That's where things get murky and we're gonna be going much deeper into that, so stay tuned for that. And then finally, the fourth thing that we're gonna be talking about this week is the thing that we mentioned at the beginning of the episode. Does your mental health actually affect your music? So, Don Nation, I hope you are absolutely freaking pumped for this week's episode of Behind the Doll with Prince Fox. And by the way, this week's episode is sponsored by the Zodiac Masterclass. We're gonna be giving a lot more detail on what that is at the end of the episode, but basically, if you wanna learn how to make 14 songs that went on to get over 100 million streams, and you get to learn from the producer who actually made those songs, then go ahead and check out the Zodiac Masterclass. It's really, really awesome. Again, we're gonna talk about it at the end of the episode. So let's go ahead and ask the heart and soul of Daw Nation, the lifeblood, the most important member of the team, <laughs> if he will introduce us to Prince Fox and take us behind the Daw. I wanna welcome everyone to this week of Behind the Daw. We have freaking Prince Fox. Prince, say what's up to Daw Nation, man. What up? How are you? Oh, dude, they're doing fantastic. They're stoked to have you. And of course, as tradition goes, we need an embarrassing story from you. Okay, well, I'll start with this jam over here. So my first show in Los Angeles was at this place called Lure. And it was about four to six weeks after my Stay With Me remix had come out. And I play my set, it's going great. And I'm about to finish up and I like roll off a filter and I get on the mic and I'm like, oh, this is my remix of Sam Smith. Stay with me, blah, blah, everyone's cheering. It's super exciting. And I 
start playing it, it's building up and it's about to drop. And literally the instant that it's about to drop, this drunk girl on stage slaps the CDJ in just like a fit of dancing and ejects the USB. <laughs> not only could I not just hit play and resume, I'm like on stage with everyone like, oh, this is the song that we came to the show for, you know, kind of waiting for the USB to reload <laughs> and the CDJ to restart so I can finish my set, you know, on the song that was going on at the time for me. The redness in my face probably exceeded that of a tomato at that point. <laughs> it's a good embarrassing one to get cracking with. Dang, dude. So were you able to recover at least a little bit or was it just like it was destroyed everything? I got on the mic. I made a joke or whatever. I, I must have had, you know, a couple beers or whatever. And I, I just like cracked a joke being like, oh, well, somebody's partying too hard. And then like riled up the crowd and then played it again. But it was nerve wracking because it was my last song. And in LA, most of the clubs close at like 145, 2 in the morning. So like you really don't have a ton of time to like come back from that. But like it ended up working out and it was fine. Dang, man. So did you find out who that girl was? No, no, no. Security swiftly removed her from the swiftly. premises. <laughs> she didn't have a chance. <laughs> Yeah, there was no chance for her. I couldn't even tell you what she looked like. She was gone that fast. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. That is embarrassing, dude. That sucks, man. Do you have any other embarrassing stories like that? That's usually like what you're saying. Most of the people that I bring on, they do have DJ embarrassing stories. Almost every single person has an embarrassing DJ story. You got any others that you want to talk about? There's so many times I feel like stuff stops or like the CDJs will randomly go out of link or into emergency loop mode. It's super nerve wracking, honestly. But at the end of the day, like, I guess that's what makes it human. Totally. Well, dude, that was embarrassing. I felt it. The listeners felt it. And so now that we've broken the ice, we can get into the deep stuff. All right. Let's do it. Cool. And I'm diving deep. Like we're going to a deep pool right now. All right. I'm here for it. Let's do it. Cool, man. All right. I was watching the Cyborg Talk interview that you did, which is a great interview, by the way. One of the things that you mentioned was that you were talking about, well, she asked if your family was very musically talented. And you said, quote, they're not musically talented, but they have plenty of anxiety and nervousness. I'm assuming that's including you. So tell me, I mean, like, what do you mean on that? Let's expand on that. So stepping back on the familial part, it's kind of a like Eastern European Jewish stereotype to be nervous and anxious and neurotic. And my family is entirely Eastern European Jews. So in terms of music, it just manifested itself into just this burning desire to be something or somebody and a constant fight for whatever it is that I'm doing to feed my sense of self-worth. You know, there have been times where like the ups and downs of life and music very much feed into my sense of self-worth because of that, you know, lingering neurosis, so to speak. So I guess you know, that desire to succeed is what keeps my work ethic and motivation up, you know, amidst the difficulties that it often presents. But yeah. So is what you're saying is that the desire and the results of success is what's keeping your anxiety and depression at bay? Is that what I heard? In some capacity, yeah. It's just like the desire to succeed at doing something that I love. Obviously, you know, there's a million and one ways somebody can perceive themselves as being successful. I don't want to say like, I make music to be successful. I'm just saying like, in the assumption that like, regardless of success, I would want to make music in that assumption, you know, the idea of being successful and not letting people down is what motivates me and both sometimes triggers anxiety, but also, you know, for the most part, keeps it at bay and keeps me working. I see what you're saying. So yeah, let's talk about specific things that cause you anxiety and depression. And this can definitely be a, I'll show you my scars if you show me yours. Like I'm more than happy to go into my depression and anxiety as well so you don't feel alone. No, I appreciate that. Well, where do I start? <laughs> we'll start with this. First and foremost, the number one trigger for me would definitely be flying. I hate flying. I'm terrified of flying. I have to fly all the time when I'm touring. And that's like the most consistent source of anxiety just because I'm scared and you know, I know all the facts and I've read the books and the, done the meditation. I have like in-flight apps that tell you, you know, how to meditate and to get control of your body and breathing. And like, I've done all that stuff and some of it works better than others, but as a general thing, flying just completely sets me off. And then another part of touring that is really hard is... And part of the reason why I wanted to take a step back from it and go at it with a fresh outlook and a bunch of new music was the disparity between being in front of a big crowd and then taking pictures and so much stimulation 
And then you go back to this hotel or motel room and you're completely alone and it's vacant. And like everyone, wherever you're from is usually sleeping at that point if you're not in the same city or town or whatever. And you're just kind of left alone with your thoughts, which for me is already a general buzzing level of anxiety. So you kind of go down these pitfalls of like analyzing every little thing about you, every little thing that you said, every interaction that you had that day, that week, that month, that year. It's kind of succumbing to my hyper analytical mind, which is helpful when it comes to music to be that analytical, but is really not helpful when you're analyzing yourself and being so hyper self critical. And I think that that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about my anxiety and neurosis, so to speak, revolve around me being hyper self critical, hyper insecure always worried about perception as if the perception is what makes me me rather than I make myself me. And like recently I've been working to overcome that and stuff, but it's a tough thing to grapple with, especially when you see your peers succeeding in a certain way or getting opportunities. And you're like, I thought that I would have gotten that or like this would have happened for me. And not to say that I'm not happy for all of them. Like I want success for everybody around me and I don't ever want it to be that. But sometimes it becomes that kind of you know, there's one slot at a festival, like it's you or the other guy. And it's a weird quantification of things that are artistic. And it just kind of creates this almost vicious cycle of, am I not good enough? Am I not this? Am I not that? And then you put something out and it reacts well and you're like, okay, like I am this good, but then something else happens. And it's just this endless loop that until you practice mindfulness and removing yourself from that situation, that loop and analyzing it from an outsider's perspective, it's really hard to break. I see what you're saying. And this is giving me a very hard question. And it was a very hard question for me to ask myself. It was very hard to give an honest answer. Do you find identity in your anxiety and depression? That's a really good question. It's funny you mentioned that because I have thought about that a lot because I think that the topic of mental illness and anxiety and depression has been a hot one for a minute. And there are certain people who I don't want to say brand around it, but it's a big part of their tone is talking about that and mental health. And I would say that internally, I very much see it as a part of who I am and what I do and why I do what I do. But I think publicly, because I'm self-conscious and I don't want people to think that I'm trying to monetize on fortune or misfortune, however you kind of slice it, I'm very wary about when I bring it up in the public domain because there are some people that are endlessly supportive no matter how you say what you say. And then I feel like, and maybe this is just my anxiety speaking that like some people kind of comb through tweets and stuff and they're like, oh, well, you're not really that anxious. Like, what do you have to be anxious about? Like, you're a successful this, like you've done that. You've worked with this person. Like, it's that feeling of being judged for not expressing how I feel in the right way or making it seem like an advertisement rather than a explanation or a plea that keeps me from hyper identifying with it in the public domain. But in private, everyone around me knows that that's me. I'm just the anxious dude. For sure. I want to comment on how when people say, because this is an argument that drives me absolutely bonkers and I hear it all the time, which is basically, what do you have to worry about? You live in a first world country, you know, you grew up in such and such house with such and such income, you basically, you don't have a right to feel sad or to feel anxious or depressed or anything like that, right? This is an argument that we've heard time and time again, especially living in the country that we do. The problem with that argument, which by the way, that's a terrible argument. It's an absolutely awful argument. The problem with that is that whoever makes that argument doesn't understand human nature and the hierarchy of needs. Do you know much about Maslow's hierarchy of needs? I don't know. Cool. Once I start saying it, I'm sure you will. So basically, it's a pyramid of needs, right? At the very bottom, they're the most core needs at the very top, the most like detailed, finessed needs. So for example, at the very bottom is like shelter, love, food, water, things that are very, very basic, right? And so the argument is that, well, there's people down at the bottom of the pyramid that are struggling with these things, but you're struggling, you know, three, four, five steps up the pyramid. So why should I care about what you're saying? The reason why is because the higher that you climb up the pyramid, the more complex the problems become. For example, if you're hungry, you go get food. 
that's it. If you're thirsty, you go get water. Now, I understand it could be complicated, especially if like someone's in Africa and they have to hike through this lion infested valley. Okay, that's complicated. But for the most part, that's still that's marginal examples, right? We're talking about the entirety of human race, but they're simple needs. You You don't have a shelter, build a shelter. You don't have love, go find love. So once we start climbing up the ladder and we start getting into things like I'm feeling depressed because of X or I'm feeling anxiety because of Y, those are such complex issues that for someone to come in and say, well, you're not struggling with something on the lower scale, therefore you shouldn't struggle with something on the higher scale. That makes literally no sense at all. That's like saying, okay, yeah, I understand that you lost a finger today, but Joe down the street lost a leg. So I don't know why you're hurting. Exactly. And I think that that's honestly indicative of a larger problem of especially internet culture is like this sense of absolutism where it's either black or it's white. There's no gray area. There's no such thing as nuance. You are X, you are Y, but you are not both. There's no more Venn diagrams when it comes to people's emotions or people's status or labels. And it's so interesting to me that that's the case when some of those very same people are advocating for spectrums and nuance in other parts of life, you know? I do know. And it's hypocritical at a very mass scale. So yeah, thank you for indulging me in that and understanding with that. There was another thing that I wrote down that I want to touch on, which was, do you remember somebody I used to know by like Gautier or Gautier? Or, yep. how, do you know how to say his name? Gautier, is that how you say it? Yeah. Got it. So that song was probably the most profoundly deep, underrated pop song I've ever heard in my life. And the reason why is because, well, there's a lot of things in there, but one of the reasons why is because he says something and he says, you can get addicted to a certain kind of sadness. And I fear that us who struggle with anxiety and depression and nervousness and things such as that, we get addicted to it in some way because we find identity in it. And maybe we receive some kind of recognition or some kind of standing out or some kind of, you know, specialness because of the situation that we're in. So is there a certain type of sadness that you're addicted to? Yeah, I mean, for the longest time, like I felt like I had to fill this role of I make sad boy future base. Here's a bunch of like sad, relatable tweets that you can retweet and stuff. And it brought out that kind of sadness in me, but along with the dopamine hit of it being responded to online. And then I just felt like if I would tweet something happy or if I was like, yo, this burger is bomb. Or if I was just being myself, people would be like, whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on here? Like, are you, are you sad? Are you not sad? Are you this or you that? And that's kind of part of the reason why I wanted to step back and be like, what am I doing? Like, what kind of music am I making? Like, what is my message that I'm trying to send to the world. I kind of touched on it in this note that I posted on my Instagram today about being so insecure and feeling like I had to be an elevator pitch. I had to say, my name is Prince Fox and I make sad boy future bass or future pop, whatever I was calling it back then. And I realized that my music tastes are eclectic. My emotions are eclectic. The human condition is that of nuance. And it wasn't until I started to embrace that, that I started really feeling good and seeing progress in my music and in my ability. And for better or for worse, most of that stuff happened behind the scenes in the past year and a half, two years when I've been a little bit more quiet. But now that I've kind of adopted that ethos and built up a catalog of music and I feel better, so to speak, I'm excited to kind of 2.0 my life and the Prince Fox project and everything else that I'm involved in, whether it's one of my projects or another person that I'm producing for, trying to be addicted to realness and understanding that sometimes you're going to be sad, sometimes you're going to be happy. And I want to be accepted for being authentic to who I am, not for playing this role of somebody that's like posting Tumblr things just for the likes. And even when I'm in a good mood being like, okay, what's some sad I could tweet today? I don't want to be that. And I feared becoming that because I I was so eager to be successful. But my whole shift in tone now is just like, I want to be real. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not, but like, I'm always going to tell you how it is. And that's how my music is going to be too. 
What a beautiful ethos to have because this plays on what you were saying a couple minutes ago, which is like people want you to be X or they want you to be Y. They, you can't be both, but you can. And I think that's something that we need to acknowledge because it's so weird that this is even a conversation that we're having because it's weird that people even think this, but people think that they put you in this box and they expect you to stay in that box, whether it's just you're a sad boy or you're a pop producer, whether you're this or whether you're that. But that's not who we are. We're actually living, walking, breathing Venn diagrams constantly. In each one of us, we are this composite of light and darkness, for lack of better words. And each of us has, you know, for the light side, representing like the happy-go-lucky, the, you know, having a good time, the cheery, whatever, right? And then we have a dark side, which is, you know, we, we have been through pain or we're a deep thinker or whatever you want to say, right? You kind of roughly separate the two. But we are, we're Venn diagrams of that and we have to feed both sides. When you feed too much of one side and you ignore another, like for example, if you just feed the light side too much and you ignore the darkness, well, that's when I feel like you start seeing overly fake people acting too happy. And if you get too much of the other side where you ignore the light and just focus on darkness, that's when you get like really like messed up, dark thoughts. I don't know how to explain it. Really creepy kind of type people that you're like, oh, like that. There's things they're saying is really, ugh. you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think that either side, if you overfeed, turns into darkness. So true, dude. So, is there anything about this concept that we were talking about that you want to add to or anything of that fashion? I just think that with artists like Billy Eilish and Lil Nas X, don't be afraid to be authentic and to be yourself. I feel so liberated that those kind of business models are working for them because it was something that I really struggled with. I was like, everyone's telling me I have to be X. Everyone's telling me I have to be Y, like freaking out. But I see that authenticity is finally something that is being rewarded. So if anybody's listening to this, I guess what I would want to add is just be yourself as best as you can be yourself and try to not be afraid of what that reality looks like. You're absolutely right. I know I mentioned this in a lot of the episodes, but this is something that I truly do feel passionate about is that, you know how you're saying there's a lot of people in the industry that are telling you to be X or telling you to be Y. Let's just get this out to the world once again. On a branding business mental illness standpoint, there's very few people who actually know what they're doing. And so if someone comes to you and says you have to be X and it doesn't feel right, do not listen to them. I mean, there might be the odd pearl that they drop where they're actually right. But for the vast majority of the time, there's so many things I've heard in the music industry. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? And I think that sometimes they are right. For example, one of my old managers that I used to work with was right in telling me that if I kept making future base, whatever, I would be X, Y, and Z. I've seen other people use that exact same rubric of what they were telling me to do and I had already had the traction and they were right. That is what would have happened. But in hindsight, it's not what was right for me, so to speak. So as much as people don't know what they're doing or whatever, whether they're right or wrong, it's in your control to be like, is this right for me? Because they're not easy ways to quote unquote make it, but like there are steps you can follow to achieve a certain level of success and just do that. But for myself, especially that's not satisfying. And for people that are hyper business minded, it's hard for them to see like, whoa, you can make like trap music or you can make EDM bangers and you're not just doing that and DJing and playing shows. Like, what are you thinking? Like, don't you want to be successful? And it took me literally until probably last week to be like, I of course want to be successful, but for the first time in forever, I can admit to myself and to whoever's asking that I want it to be on my own terms. You're able to put something into words that I've heard in other avenues in life. I've never been able to put it into the music industry part, right? Because anyone who's listening to this can do it. They can literally mimic what the biggest people in the world are doing right now and see success in a very relatively short amount of time. That is absolutely, completely possible. But do you know who Jordan Peterson is? Jordan Peterson? I don't. He's a very big politician guy. He like breaks down things very logically, right? He doesn't necessarily take a side on politics, but he breaks down things logically and helps people understand. So he's absolutely fantastic. He's one of the most logical people I've ever heard in my life. But what he was talking about was, so this is not what we were talking about, but it relates completely to it. But he was talking about people doing drugs. And when he was saying like, why in essence, it's a bad idea, because one of the biggest arguments that people say is that like, well, it's transcendent. I have experiences I think of things that I wouldn't have, like my mind is open and so on and so forth like that. Then he's like, you're absolutely right. You can do drugs and you will have those experiences. The problem with that is, is that you will receive wisdom that you're not ready for. And it's a shortcut to wisdom. 
And if you don't pay the proper price for that wisdom, it will eventually come back to bite you. And relating this back to the music industry, yes, if you don't lay the proper groundwork and you do the work to stay true to yourself and you take a shortcut to success, it will come back to just savagely bite you. Can we agree with that? 100%. And I feel like that's what it did to me. Not that I had intentionally taken a shortcut, but I saw a lot of success early on in my career that I wasn't ready for. And you never want to feel undeserving, but I've just come to the conclusion that I had to go through everything that I went through to be as good as I am at what I do now. And I'm only saying as good as I am relative to myself. I try to not compare myself to others, but there was so much that happened early on and people that I was introduced to that I wasn't ready to meet. Here's an example. And luckily it hasn't really blown up in my face, but had this kind of thing happened today, it would have been an incredible thing for my career. But because of when it happened, really nothing came of it. But like I was introduced to Post Malone about a month after White Iverson got signed to Republic because I was on Republic as well. And we hit it off. We were schmoozing. He was telling me just all these funny stories. And his A&R was like, oh yeah, I'll connect you guys in a session. And at the time, like I wasn't doing that many sessions and I wasn't as good of a session producer. And that kind of heat of that initial relationship really fizzled out. At the time, I was like, well, why am I not getting into session? We're on the same label, blah, blah, blah. And like kind of being a little bit bratty about it. But now I'm like, it's good I didn't get in that session because now I thankfully have a chance at making a really good first impression. It's unfortunate that the things lined up the way that they did, but I feel grateful for that. That is a perfect example, right? Because everyone's like, if only I can collaborate or work with said person, or if only I can get on said label. Well, maybe the fact of the matter is that you're just not ready, not just skill-wise. You could be ready skill-wise. Maybe you're just not ready mentally yet. You shouldn't rush the process because your career, your music creating abilities, it is a living, breathing thing, right? And it needs time to properly grow. I wouldn't go take my one-year-old son and be like, all right, son, I'm going to teach you how to hang drywall today. You know what I mean? That'd be like forcing him to do something that he's just not ready for. You know, like he could barely pick up a freaking hammer. Like, how is he supposed to help me hang drywall? You see the concept though? No, 100%. And I'm fully on board with that idea as well. It makes it more palatable to just simplify it like that. Sometimes you're ready. Sometimes you're not. Things tend to unfold as they should. And it's best to not feel spited by that and other people's success versus your own. Because chances are, not even chances are, 100% that behind the scenes, they worked 10 times as hard as you did to achieve the result that you wanted. And you're only seeing the external, so to speak. So really quick, I have an extremely deep concept that I want to go into. It comes from our good old friend, Gary Vanderchuk. But before we get into that, let's knock out the music business tip, if that's all right. Yeah, go for it. Perfect. So this week's music business tip, by the way, I didn't know if you knew or not. So by trade, before I even got into music or anything, I'm a social media marketer and I'm completely passionate about that and like getting people's message to the right people at the right time through the right medium, right? That's something I'm extremely passionate about. And so one of the biggest things that we've been talking about here on Behind the Daw is how to properly use Instagram to do that. Instagram is by large the most popular social media platform in the world. And there is a way to use it without being fake. There is a way to use it to enhance what you're trying to do instead of taking away from what you're trying to do. And so there's a tool that I found recently. And a lot of people are going to shrug their shoulders and, you know, kind of get the stank face on and be like, yeah, I'm just not in that. And that's fine. I'm going to present an argument. And if the argument doesn't make sense to you logically, then that's completely fine. But to me, it makes a lot of sense. So here's what I found this week. It's something called Kicksta. You ever heard of that before? I have not. No. Cool. So basically what it is, what most people call it's automation or a bot. Now, I hate that term because that's not what it is. Like me saying bot, does it kind of make you cringe a little bit? Yes and no. Like I understand the value in it. So I'm not super cringy on that stuff. Cool. That's good. Even me do. And I hear bot, I'm kind of like, ugh, you know, like, uh, because I know what people think about it. But basically, it's this it's this platform you pay a monthly subscription to and they help you automate your process, right? Now, the problem with this is, is that most of the automations that I've seen, I've seen things like, Zulud, I think is one, Jarvie is one. And with all of these different bots that I've seen, it's never been that great because it's so, most of the time the result that comes out of it is this guy 
who just goes in and says, hey, auto comment on all these pages. And it's just like a lightning bolt or like a fist pump. And it's like, this is not good. This is terrible. You ruin everything for everyone. You know what I mean? But what Kixta does is that it's all AI driven. It's machine learning. It's constantly learning what's going on. So it does do like the traditional auto like, because it's focused around engagement, right? Or follow or whatever, right? Like it does that, but it does it on a much more engagement basis and it's constantly learning. So it constantly learns, hey, people from this page aren't reacting to your product or your page very well. People from over here really are. And so it's basically a lead magnet, right? Because it's helping you find the people that are going to resonate with you the most so that you can interact with them. And a lot of people say like, well, you know, you're following people without really following them or you're unfollowing them right after or you're liking people's comments when you really aren't doing it. It's just a machine doing it. The reason why I think this is okay, and this is an argument in my mind that I think that really stands out is this. I'm paying for this service to do it. I don't have time to do it. And I would actually just pay someone else to do it as well. So if I was to bring in my cousin, Tiandra, and was like, Tiandra, I'm going to pay you X amount of money to go through and engage on, you know, people's pages and stuff like that. Would anyone have a problem with that? Probably not because it's an actual person, right? So what's the problem here? Is it just because it's a machine? Because it's an AI? Because AI is getting really close to humanity. To me, it's like, you know what? I would pay someone to do this anyways because I'm too busy and it's going to help me eventually lead me to the people that I really want to talk to that I really want to gain a relationship with. It's kind of helped me sift through all of the garbage that's on Instagram and getting to the people that I really care about. Does that make sense? 100%. I'm literally looking at their website now. It's genius. It is. It's absolutely fantastic. Depending on where you're at financially, it could be pricey. You know, it's about $50 a month. But, you know, if you're making money off your music or if you want to make money off your music, this is a fantastic investment. This is something I fully endorse. By the way, this is not sponsored. I am not sponsored by them whatsoever. This is just something genuinely that I found. I'm like, this is freaking awesome. This is something that I can get behind. I mean, how does all that sound to you? As soon as we get off this interview, I'm definitely going to take a look. That sounds awesome, dude. So that is the music business concept for this week. Hopefully that helped you guys out. There is a link down in the description of this episode you can check out. So, all right. Should we get back to the deep concept from uh, Gary Vee, eh? Let's do it. I love Gary Vee. I just barely found this out for those that maybe have a hard time with his profanity because he is very vulgar. That's just kind of Gary though, which, you know, I couldn't really listen to that. I have a hard time with profanity, especially when like, I'm around kids and stuff because like, I have two kids. But there is a curse-free version of his podcast that literally goes in and takes out all the cursing. So if you're someone that, that have benefit from that, high five. It was freaking amazing. But on there... Kind of the last two episodes that he's talking about is how it's May right now. You know, people are going to be graduating from high school and college and stuff like that. And he says this is one of the most sickening times of the year for him because he knows that there are so many people who are going to be graduating and getting out into the real world that have no freaking idea what to do. They're going to get caught in the nine to five or they're going to go through like what I went through and what you went through where they try to take shortcuts to fame or what have you, right? Or they make decisions based on fear-based decisions rather than on what they truly want to do. And this terrifies him. And what he said to do, which is, I've done this before and I can testify of the power of it. He says, if you want to see what regret 50, 60, 70 years from now actually looks like, go volunteer at a rest home for like a couple hours. Guaranteed, you will find someone there that's basically on their deathbed or extremely old and they are going to be filled with regret of things that they wish they did in their lives. He says it is one of the most terrifying things he's ever seen in his life. That is something that will shock you so hard to the core that you will never make another decision knowing that you could potentially regret it in the future. And this is something that I can resonate with right now. There's a family member of ours, of me and my wife's. I'm not going to say who, but basically on his deathbed right now, we went and seen him and we talked with him and the sheer regret of what he's done in life, whether it was business-wise or whether it was like family decisions or whatever, right? Honestly, Prince, I've never been so terrified in my entire life to see that kind of look in someone's eyes. And so my question to you right now is, Is there anything in your life right now that if you keep living the way that you're living right now will basically force you to feel that regret later on? Is there anything in your life right now that you can see that sticks out to you? It's like, I know if I keep doing this, I will have that type of regret later on in the future. Oh man, in my career, no. I think the only thing that sticks out, but not even in such a harsh way, but I'm sure I could be more mindful of my waste and how I source what I eat. 
I'm trying to become more conscious of that. But I think as times are changing and the climate crisis is escalating, I could see myself in a few decades from now being like, I should have been more active about this. Like we're really in a bad place. That's probably like the number one thing. Otherwise, try to go easier on myself. I think that like my constant state of being self-deprecating and self-critical puts an unnecessary stress on me and I'm sure elevates my blood pressure. You know, just for my health, I should try and be more accepting of myself. So let's stop right there. I want to expand on that because what is an actual conversation that you have with yourself when you are too hard on yourself? Like, is this really quality? Is this really your best work? What are you doing? What is this for? Why are you saying this? Why are you doing this? Why did you handle that situation in that way? Why weren't you better at making conversation when you were introduced to this person? Why did you freeze up? What's wrong with you? Like you're so comfortable in this other situation. Why would you not be comfortable here? I don't understand. Or why are you confident in singing certain notes when you're practicing, but then you start recording and you freeze up? What's wrong with you? Like, What's the block for, Sam? Just giving myself this constant push of, dude, come on, you're better than this. You're better than this. Why, 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 why? And constantly asking yourself why is a really good way to get the best possible product, but also to drive yourself insane. And I would say those are the most consistent conversations that I have with myself. Something I do want to bring up with this concept. So the reason why I even feel qualified with saying this is because much like yourself, I've experienced anxiety and depression and I have taken an inordinate amount of therapy and counseling and read books on this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of mental illness techniques and concepts that I fully understand. And one of them, I think one of the reasons why those conversations are causing you so much grief, the term of it is a cognitive dissonance. It's separating the pure you from the mistake you. So when we have these type of conversations with myself, why would you do that? Or why would I do that? Or anything like that. It's still separating yourself. It's kind of cognitively separating the pure, the perfect, the good decision, Sam, from the bad, the inordinance, the rebellious, Sam. It's separating the two. And that in and of itself, just that act right there of separating those two parts of you is actually going to give you anxiety and depression. Because it's, in essence, you know, for lack of a better term, you're splitting your soul at that point. And so it doesn't work like that. It's like, it'd be the equivalent of, you know, if you take your hand, you're like, well, the pure side of my hand is fingers one through two and the bad part of my hand is fingers four through five. I have to separate them so they don't touch and they don't interact and they're completely different. You actually have to like cut your hand in half to make sure they separate. That is the equivalent of what we're doing with our mind. That in and of itself is going to give you a crap ton of mental pain. No, 100%. And yeah, it just kind of goes back to what we were saying just about being accepting of ourselves a little bit more. It's a crazy concept, but at the end of the day, it's what is going to get you through the ups and downs of life. You're absolutely right. So even stepping back from that concept of the cognitive dissonance of separating yourself, let's examine some of those conversations that you're having. Is this the highest quality that you can? Why did you say that? Why did you do that? So on and so forth. Like these kinds of things, to me, it's just, it's a regretful mind state. Basically, what I've come to realize for myself when I have those kind of conversations with myself mentally is because I felt like I messed something up that can't be repaired or it was a once in a lifetime opportunity and I messed it up. And the fact of the matter is, is that any of those situations that you just brought up to me or any situation that I can think of of my mind, I can't really think of anything that you can't fix unless you do like something absolutely insanely terrible, like bomb a building or, you know, murder someone. You're beyond your control at that point. But I mean, like putting out a song that wasn't the highest quality, you can fix that. You could release the next song that's the highest quality. Or why did you say that? Well, you have another conversation of talking to someone sometime. A lot of people forget about what we say anyways. I mean, how does all this sound to you? I wholeheartedly agree. I think that as scary as what I'm about to say sounds, it's also worth finding solace in that every moment in life is the perfect storm of a once in a lifetime opportunity. No matter how many times you meet someone or you have a chance to remedy something, Every new moment is a new once in a lifetime opportunity to accomplish X, Y, and Z. So while that's a daunting thing to think about in hindsight, being like, oh, that was once in a lifetime, that perfect storm of X, Y, and Z, me meeting this person, that person in this room, that room, there's an infinite amount of moments ahead of you theoretically that you can make your situation better. The old expression, you make your bed, you sleep in it. So sometimes your bed's going to be not made and then it's not that comfortable to sleep, but 
you can make your bed. You can get out of bed and and go get a good night's sleep. You know, like you said, nothing can't be fixed or smoothed over to a certain extent. You're absolutely right. Again, unless it's something crazy, like the marginal crazy examples, right? Which I've never been through any of those. I'm assuming that you've never been through any of those. I mean, like you would really have to really mess up to do something like that. Like insane. Anyways, it doesn't matter. So with that being said, though, I did hear a phrase one time and it has to do with like, you know, you make your bed and sleep in it. And it's actually two different phrases. One of them came from my father-in-law. One of the deepest things my father-in-law ever told me was this, why sometimes you make right decisions and sometimes you have to make the decision right. When he told me that, like it was out of nowhere. I was like, what? <laughs> that was like, that's book worthy. Like that was crazy. And then it plays on to the other thing that I heard with you make your bed, you sleep in it. Well, sometimes when you make your bed, you sleep in it. Sometimes the bed sucks. Well, guess what? You can still get a good night's sleep, wake up, kick the bed over, burn it to the ground and build a new bed tomorrow. It's what we're talking about right now. It's like, if you mess up, fix it. It's that simple. You know what I mean? Even if fixing it takes 10 times longer than it took to mess it up, that's fine. You still fix it and you move on. It's one of those things where it's like a very Gary Vee moment where he's like, just do it. You just got to do it. I never get so pumped as when I'm like going for a run listening to Gary Vee. He really, he's got the sauce. He really makes everybody very energized and proactive, which I appreciate. You're absolutely right, dude. So the final concept that I want to talk about is when it plays into, you know, like my background as an internet marketer and stuff like that, there's a lot of gems of knowledge within marketing that can be applied to anything and especially in life. One of them is that when you're trying to sell a product or you're trying to get someone to do something, the worst thing that you can do is to try to sell the product. The best thing that you can do is try to sell the result. And so the way that you sell the result is like, for example, nobody cares about a piece of metal that has a keyboard on it and that connects to the internet. Well, I mean, that part is kind of the result. But people do care about a thing that will allow them to be portable and to create music on and to connect with anyone in the world. No one cares about the product. Everyone cares about the result. And so the way that you are able to convey the results is to talk about pain points. For example, if I was selling to you a laptop to produce music on, I wouldn't say, do you check out this laptop? It has X amount of RAM. It has this kind of terabyte hard drive. The majority of the people aren't going to understand that. There's going to be a little subset of people that do. For the majority of the people, they're not going to. So the way that I could make sure to get everyone be like, dude, you know what sucks? is when you're on tour and you have a beautiful musical idea, but you have to wait till you get back home to your desktop. That really sucks. But with this thing, dude, you don't have to do that anymore. You can produce anywhere you want. You know what's also awesome? You can connect on the internet anywhere in the world and talk with anyone else. You know, like if your girlfriend back home, it sucks leaving her there. So why don't you just get on there and have a nice little conversation. You're selling the result by addressing the pain points. My question comes from this concept, which is back in the day when you were getting into producing all that kind of stuff, What were some of those pain points that you had that you're just like, man, X is really hurting me or Y is really making my production or like my progress suffering, you kind of a thing. Like what were some of the biggest pain points of when you were just a beginning producer? The biggest pain points. It's weird. I never thought of it like that. I just kept like making stuff until it sounded more like what I wanted it to even though I have a pretty intense theoretical knowledge of how music production software works just because I went to school with it, I feel like I put in a ton of time, but I always had wished that I had put in that much time earlier on in my life when I was playing a ton of hockey and like that was my main priority. I think that the idea of time as the number one asset, not to sound like Gary V, has forever been something that I've struggled with, like wishing that I had done what I did today, you know, a week ago, or like in the moment realizing it would have been really dope if I had gotten this done already. Whether or not I was thinking about doing the thing in the time that I wish I had done it is irrelevant, but just the notion of it would have been way better if it had happened earlier on in the timeline of my life. When it comes to like hurt points in actual production outside of the time domain, I think that if I'm going to be nerdy about it, probably just like reverb settings. I wish that there was a better way to describe certain types of reverb settings that weren't just like plate or room or whatever. What types of reverbs make things feel a certain way or makes them perceived a certain way? You can know all the theory behind the different kinds of reverbs. You can know exactly how they're emulated, what it does, blah, blah, blah. But 
to know what everything feels like in the club and when it's consumed on different monitors and speakers. And you really have to try everything and learn by trial and error, which is a crazy thing that knowledge does not equal practical knowledge of perception. So if I ever were to create a plugin, it would be a practically inclined and titled reverb plugin. <laughs> That's beautiful, dude. One of my main takeaways from what you just said, though, from the going back to the first time part is because I've had that same pain point. And I think everyone has. I've heard a lot of people say when you're very beginning, it doesn't matter what you do in the studio. As long as you're in there putting in time, just messing around, you'll eventually find your way, which I agree with to a point. But what I wish I had was like a proper understanding of how to progress the quickest way instead of saying, oh, just go play, do whatever you want, just play with this, you'll eventually figure out. Or it's like, no, as far as music, music has these types of elements to it. This is how you can get better. It's kind of more like a guideline. It would have been really fantastic to know clear back in the day, holy crap, there's these elements in a song. And so I need to know how to do these elements and then I can tweak them and break the rules. Really? That would have been amazing. It's like the timing of knowledge. And like the pacing of knowledge. It's such a weird thing, the concept of time in general, but I 100% agree with that. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, what we're talking about here kind of plays into the next thing that you were talking about. It's that you wish you would have known that to evoke a certain emotion, you had to use, you know, like X reverb or whatever, right? That kind of plays into exactly what we're talking about. Like you wish there was kind of some type of resource to tell you beforehand, hey, without you wasting all this time trying to figure this stuff out, here's all this stuff that we've figured out. Therefore, you can have this and you can learn it exponentially quicker than we did. Yeah, like knowledge of perception rather than theoretical knowledge, I think is really important. You're absolutely right, dude. This was a fantastic episode. Did you have a good time? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Is there any final words or anything that you want to say? Thank you. I appreciate you and I hope to see you soon. What's up, Don Nation? Did you enjoy that? Did you learn a lot? Now, don't head out yet because there's a few things that we still need to talk about. A few more valuable pieces of information that we feel like are going to help you. We as in all of Don Nation, like me and Ben and Tevin and Alex, not just me, not the royal we. I'm, I'm rambling. Let's keep going. So before we talk about those things, I would like to remind you to head down below this video, hit the subscribe button, hit that little notification bell so that you get notified every single time that we put out a new piece of content and you can keep growing as a musician, as a music producer, as a singer, as a songwriter, wherever you fit on that line. Also, if you like this video, go down and hit that like button. In fact, don't even hit it, slap it. Slap it as hard as you want. I mean, you know, terms and conditions may apply, but go ahead and slap that like button if you did like this video. Also, you can leave a comment and let us know if you liked this episode. And if you didn't, you can still let us know. I'd love to know that, okay? With all that out of the way, Daw Nation, there's a few other things that we need to talk about. Number one is our In The Daw series. Now, what the heck is that? You're on Behind The Daw? There's an In The Daw? What? That's a thing? That's a thing. So the difference is this. Right now you're on Behind the Dot. And on Behind the Dot, we interview music producers, music industry experts, right? People of that nature on an emotional, philosophical, branding, music business-ish basis, right? It's kind of our thing over here. Now in the Dot is where we completely focus on the technical side. How do you process your kick? How do you sidechain yourself? How do you sound design this thing? How did you write that melody? How did you mix this? How did you master this? All that kind of stuff. And what we do is we, we don't just talk about that kind of stuff. We bring on huge music producers. They come and dissect their songs in real time, right? Songs that have already been proven to work, okay? They come on, they show you, they go in the DAW with you and they show you everything. So if you wanna check that out, that is over here on the DAW Nation YouTube channel. And if you're listening on the podcast, guess what? You can also check it out on the podcast. They're on, they're on the podcast as well. I just remembered something. Also, if you're on the podcast, obviously you can't subscribe on the podcast. Well, I mean, maybe depending on the platform that you can, but go ahead and follow on the podcast as well so you get updated every time we put out a new episode. But back to what I was saying. So if you're interested in In The Dot, again, it's over here on the YouTube series and you can find it on the podcast as well. Now, the final thing I wanna to talk to you about is the thing that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, which is the Zodiac Masterclass. What the heck is that? So we came together, we at Dawn Nation came together with Zan Griffin. He made an album called the Zodiac Album, which went on to get over 100 million streams. And guess what? We came together and he broke down all 14 of those songs. Seriously, all 14 of those songs. Songs that are already proven to work. He shows you everything. 
every sound, every melody, every kick, every snare, every everything inside of it. He shows you how to make those things. And guess what? You can take that information and start applying it to your music today. You can literally take the best information, information that you know is going to work, and start applying it to your music today. So if you want more information on this, then go ahead and head over to DaNation.net. You can find it over there. Also, there is a link down in the description. But right now we have a 50% launch still going on, which means that the Zodiac Masterclass is 50% off. It's fantastic, right? I love that crap. So if you want to hop on it, I would do it right now because it's currently 50% off. Plus, you get project files, bonus presets, stems, a whole bunch of stuff. So I'd highly encourage you to head on over to dawnation.net and check that out as well. Also, if you haven't checked out the school base yet, you totally should. That is our huge sound design course with AU5. It's gigantic. It's massive. Freaking like 20 plus hours long, okay? Showing the most advanced techniques possible. So if you're interested in that, again, dawnation.net, also link down in the description. But Dawnation, I really hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Behind the Daw. And if you did, again, go ahead, comment, like, subscribe, repost, follow, send me a letter. The reason why we ask you to do this is because the more feedback we get from you, the more we know we're moving in the right direction because we want to make sure we're putting out the highest quality content for you. And so if you let us know through the comments, through likes, through subscribing, then we know that we're on the right path. But Don Nation, thank you so much for joining us for this week's episode of Behind the Daw. And make sure to come back next week because we have an In the Daw episode with biometrics. That one is really, really good. If you haven't checked out the previous biometrics in the dot, go ahead and check that out before you watch the second biometrics episode, which is coming out next week. Awesome, Donation. You're awesome. We love you. That's, that's not even a heart. That's just a, it's just a zero. There we go. There's a heart. Let's try it again. All right, Donation. We love you. Chug, chug, chug. Did it right this time. And we'll see you on next week's episode of Behind the Dot. What's up, Don Nation? I'm thinking about buying my wife a freaking Apple Watch today. Cheers. And number three. Or number three. The air's on. Gah!